And start okay. streaming. Yep. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday night live stream. On the phone, I got Mr. Cruz from Elegance Corals, who is a master of the side of filtration. <laughs> How are you doing today, Cruz? <laughs> doing fine, Doug. Doing fine. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. So I figured a good topic today would be talking about filtration and overfiltration and can your tank be too clean? On the market now we got so many different kind of ways to filter and clean your tank. There's a ton of different stuff and I mean I know from experience you can certainly over chemical filtration. Um, can you over skim? Can you over mechanical filtration? That's another one I want to dig into a little bit today. Okay. Uh, quick shout out. Great topics. I think it will be a good one. Quick shout out, Mad Dogs, Pet Solistics, Brinks, Lisa's Aquatics, what is going on guys? Blinky Fish, East Coast Reefer, Dr. Welsh, good, good evening guys, happy to see you guys all on today. Braveheart, welcome. Hey guys. So Cruz, in your line of work, you actually deal with filtration quite a bit <laughs> on the coral mm -hmm. side and not yes. so much the coral side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> um... So, okay, um, just starting with mechanical filtration, um, mm -hmm. is it possible to strip too much from the water, you think? If you're running too fine a filtration, is that something that anyone would have to worry about? Well, I mean, uh, when you're talking about too fine, um, I guess uh, in the hobby, the most we have is, what, 100 micron? Yeah, for, micron? for socks or mesh. Yeah, but those tend to typically... Uh, clog up fast and then they overflow so it typically bypasses mm -hmm. a lot of it so it just overflows your socks goes into the next you know goes into the next sock hopefully it gets caught there but if you had one open then it would overflow and go into the sump and just recirculate again okay um can you over filter i want to say for clarity of water no but okay. for nut nutrient properties absolutely yeah. okay so I, I was half considering too, because I I have a filter roller that I'm putting on my next tank, which is going to be awesome, because I never change filter socks enough, so it's pretty much pointless. Um, now with that, if you were to combine that with say like a skimmer, um, like a turf scrubber, or a big refugium, all mm -hmm. this type of stuff, do you think I know potentially could algae or that type of stuff strip too much nutrients from the water? Could you? Um, the yeah, the dissolved nutrients, um, mm -hmm. you know, utilizing uh, Kato, algae turf scrubber, or whatnot, mm -hmm. I believe is in direct competition for your corals because they also take up in nitrogen and phosphates as yep. well. So I would say that you would have an out, com an out competition utilizing mm -hmm. macroalgae excessively. Yep. So you actually have to watch, uh, watch that. Before, uh, back in the old days, we all wanted to aim for zero. Nowadays, we're aiming for above zero, just above it. Well, I think, and that typically, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say back in the day, I don't think the filtration was quite up to par to actually compete that much. Correct. And Correct. now, I think you know some of these turf scrubbers and other stuff, especially if you're mul using multiple means at the same time, you can get pretty close to zero. Mm -hmm. And zero is mm -hmm. bad for anything. You never want zero nitrates. You never want zero phosphates. You always want some in your system because corals need them as well to grow. Correct. And uh, what was available to the hobby back then were also not so good testing, you know, <laughs> testing kits. Yep. We were utilizing basically a modified pull, pull test kit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we're actually seeing, and then we're also utilizing modified freshwater dip strips. You remember those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't hey, really give terms. you a super accurate, a super accurate reading like some of these uh, more higher end uh, titration kits. Mm -hmm. So what we thought was zero may not have actually been zero. And some of the green hair algae gives you a false zero because it's also utilizing up a lot of the nutrients. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I've seen people's tanks too, where they have, you know, hair algae all over the rocks. They test it like, I got no nutrients. But it's basically that mm -hmm. algae is absorbing in their tank and that's what's fueling it. Correct, correct. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it can give you a false sense of, you know, yes, I'm doing everything right. But then you have this green out, uh, hair algae outbreak. And mm -hmm. what ends up happening is as they decide that they want to kill it, you know, utilizing infimbetazole or, you know, some other type of 
algae killer or algicide, mm -hmm. you know, they're forgetting that it's releasing the nutrients back in. So what ends up happening is that, uh, oh, sorry, yep. somebody was trying to cross the road. Um, yeah, so what ends up happening is that they're releasing all these nutrients back into their system uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. And then they create cyano, uh, cyano issues as well, because all of a sudden, the bacterial population spikes, increases the CO2. And now you have a, uh, how do you say, not ideally aerobic system. Yeah. So that's when cyano starts outbreaking, especially after a lot of people start killing their green hair algae. And they're like, ah, I'm freaking out. You know, they're doing the vodka dosing, all of a sudden, green hair algae starts dying, bacterial bloom happens, Too water's much. cloudy, slimy. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and it drives off all that oxygen and the utilization that the, the oxygen from the bacteria population and the increased explosion of it mm -hmm. starts driving the oxygen down and the CO2 levels up. And that's when they actually see that pH sag. Yes. And it's, yeah. And at that point, their tank goes into, I want to call it a gas imbalance. True. And that's, you had a good point though. That's from going too fast, right? Making those adjustments mm -hmm. too quick and not gradually doing, giving your system time to adjust to it. Correct. Correct. So it's typically the knee jerk reaction. You know, you see green hair algae, you go, oh, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to go ahead and dose vodka. I'm going to dose sugar. I'm going to dose vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And they do it so rapidly sometimes that, you know, they're like, oh, well, I have a hundred gallon system. It says to dose X amount of nopox or some other form of carbon dosing mm -hmm. into their system. And all of a sudden, it's like, boom, <laughs> you increase the bacterial population so rapidly, you know, all of a sudden your oxygen levels also go down. The, the alcohol also drives off uh, um, oxygen molecules very, very quickly, and you guess that. Yeah. Now, you, you made another comment earlier about mm -hmm. not having enough time for the aerobic bacteria to catch up. Mm -hmm. Now, on if you're running through too much flow, do you think that could also inhibit, like if you're just hammering flow through your sump, if that's not giving enough dwell time with those nutrients in the bacteria? Not necessarily, because bacteria is also not, not just found on the surface of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the misinformations that we're getting from the hobby, is that, you know, beneficial bacteria is only on the rocks and in the sand, and it's not true. Um, in the wastewater water treatment facilities, we have beneficial bacteria that's floating in the water column itself. Mm -hmm. So over skimming, kind of like what you're leading into, over skimming the good bacteria out of the water column, you can also cause an imbalance and, uh, you know, drive your population down because it can't, it can't resettle into the sump, especially if you have very, very fine micron socks. Yep. Once it starts impacting and it's uh, kind of like making beer when you're uh, when you're trying to do filtration of the yeast. Once the first layer gets in and kind of plugs up some of the holes, now you start getting better filtration through the you know second, third, fourth passes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So as the bacteria starts building up, or the mom or detritus into the filter socks, all of a sudden you're starting to pull out of beneficial bacteria, beneficial you know particulates that the copepods and any other microfauna would be able to eat in mm -hmm. your refugium. So you're taking away their food uh, to an extent. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Because they don't just absorb nutrients from the water. So the dissolved nutrients doesn't really help, you know, the microfauna in any way. Mm -hmm. nope, they need the particulates and some of the detritus because they are detritivores. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so yeah. The overall, I would say, the overall benefit to the system if you actually utilize to find filtration, you know, especially on the filter sock side right as it's coming in mm -hmm. would also impede your uh, what I would call your biodiversity you're pulling out bacteria you're pulling out pods you're pulling yeah. out um, you know all, all the, the good stuff as well correct correct so one of the other kind of things I was considering around this I mean so you got all the stuff uh, actually someone just made a good question for it goes by uh, maybe bacterial bloom as a result of carbon dosing you definitely can um, mm -hmm. Same thing, a lot of people when they first start carbon dosing, especially go too fast, you will get that white kind of milky slime over your rocks and everything else, and mm -hmm. that is basically a bacteria bloom. And it's good if you're trying to defeat dinos, if you're trying to get rid of the green hair algae, but you have to remember that the skimmer only does so much, mm -hmm. especially for aeration. If you're pulling out that bacterial army that you just created to defeat 
the green hair algae and the dinoflagellates, you need some other way to give it more air. Yeah. And I don't care how, but you need to give it more air without skimming out all the beneficial bacteria. Mm -hmm. You know? Just a good old microbubbling, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And once again, microbubbling, you could, there's so many different ways. I was trying to come up with the most repeatable and, um, you know, a repeatable way that's very, very cheap. Very, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, once again, I'm not look, looking to get any compensation for it. I'm not looking to, you know, make millions of dollars off of it. The thing is that I'm tired of, you know, hearing people call me and saying, hey, my tank just crashed. What happened? Mm -hmm. And I lost everything. I lost all my fish. You know, I'm very, you know, I'm very soft on the inside, even though I may be hard on the outside. Um, so, I, I don't like seeing things suffer. Nobody does. I have a question, though. Uh, what is the most yeah. common thing that has caused that that you've dealt with when helping other people? Like a crash or something that happened? Um, typically, um, going too fast, reading the instructions on a ball, even though they may be conservative, sometimes they don't understand the balance of your system. Mm -hmm. And I think that people really need to understand what they're doing, what they're dosing into their system. I understand that some things are proprietary, you know, some proprietary mixes and whatnot. But I mean, even on ChemiClean, it says air rate with a bubbler. Yeah. You, you know, and people, you know, go over that and they're like, okay, I counted three scoops. Okay. But what about the aeration? Oh, I got my skimmer on. Yeah. But the skimmer's doing other stuff other than just aeration. And where's your intake coming from? Is it coming from outside with fresh air? Because it specifically says fresh air. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and I looked at their most recent directions, and it, it's very, it's as plain as day. Utilize a bubbler, uh, a bubbler or an air stone. Yeah, I always, whenever I'm and, doing that too, I always take off the cup on my skimmer and just let it overflow out. Mm -hmm. Another thing goes correct, and, and and not only that, but you're also utilizing fresh air pulled out from outside. So you got the benefits of both worlds. Yeah, in that one. No, exactly. That definitely goes a long way. So we did talk a bit. Actually, I got another random one of uh, dry skimming versus wet skimming. Do you think there's any big, massive difference on that? I, I like a personally, I do a really dry skim. But, I do too. Yeah. Um, we do, uh, in some cases, when we're doing some, uh, some other stuff, we do a wet skim. Depends on uh, the application. And once again, it, it's all application based. What are you trying to accomplish? What are your goals? Mm -hmm. And people, I mean, when they go, well, I run my skimmer 24-7. And I said, okay, that's great. But do you know what you're pulling out? They said, yeah, a lot of junk. But what if that junk actually feeds the rest of the ecosystem in your aquarium? Yeah, it's true. You know, what What if it sucks up baby copepods or amphipods or something like that? And Because it is. I see them. I see, yeah, I see them. I see them in there, especially if you're doing a wet skim. Well, when I change my socks, even, I always pull out the big amphipods and throw them back in my little huge frag area. I save the big Correct. ones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you know what I'm talking about. No, um, exactly. So, so sometimes these, you know, those amphipods, the larger ones especially, are the breeders. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be able to sustain your tank as natural as possible, you kind of want those little, uh, and I was going to call them zooplankton, to be able to breed, breed and feed the system naturally as well. Most of the times we feed our, our, our refugium, we don't feed our tank directly. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yep. And our refugium feeds our tank. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we also removed the sponge, you know, the, the black block sponge. Yep. Um, because it also traps a lot of, uh, I, w I would call it, um, beneficial nutrients, beneficial particulates, beneficial, you know, some decomposing amphipods, decomposing food. Mm -hmm. back into the system, especially when you stir it up just a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and that's the way we typically go is we'd agitate, you know, agitate the, uh, the Kato a little bit, shake it out, and let a lot of the things go to the return pump area mm -hmm. and get sucked in. If they get chopped up, they get chopped up their food anyways. <laughs> and it's broadcast. And it's broadcast feeding. Well, a lot of that actually makes it out completely whole into the tank anyways. At least in a lot of oh, the water yeah. pumps, like because they kind of spiral inside. They're not really chopping it like a lot of the old pumps. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Everyone's yeah. concerned about chopping, and I'm like, well, they're uh, kind of small. I use my you know, auto feeder through through mm -hmm. my return pump sometimes, and those pellets are coming out full. There's no little powders coming out of there. So if Correct. if that can make it, they can definitely come through. 
<laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, do you really want to filter out a lot of that good stuff and mm -hmm. keep on dumping more and more unnecessary money just to pull it back out in your skimmer <laughs> or to pull it out in a filter slot? So, exactly. Okay. So here's another thing that I was kind of laughing at thinking about today. If you are over filtering, your, t your tank's so clean... You can balance it out by feeding and putting more nutrients back in your tank, but then it's kind of like this like cat and tail game where you're back and forth, or cat and mouse game, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yep, absolutely. So mechanical, I mean, it's a little harder to do, but yes, you potentially can do it through mechanical filtration. Chemical side, mm -hmm. you can most definitely mm -hmm. overfilter. Um, carbon, oh, absolutely. Carbon, for instance, should be one that's used sparingly. Mm -hmm. So on... Too much carbon can actually strip out, you know, all of the good stuff from corals. Even it can affect them. I've seen it affecting mm -hmm. growth tips, different things. Uh, I know potentially like lateral line, all these other type of things that could come out of running too much carbon in the system. Especially if you get those powders in the tank; it's not good for it. Oh, absolutely. And I believe uh, my uh, my mentor uh, Lang Sai also mm -hmm. did a video a long time ago. I want to say a better part of uh, half a decade ago. He mentioned. Uh, yeah, he did a video on overstripping the water of organics or beneficial organics out of the water. Mm -hmm. And also, it's non-discriminatory. You know, carbon just pulls out almost anything, as well as some of these resins, like uh, the polyfilter or some of these other DI resins can actually strip out too much. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the chem cleans. You're talking about, um, you know, the other or, resin balls. Yeah, or too yeah. much activated carbon, I mean... Correct. Or some of the resins, Correct. like gee, a lot. All, the big thing they do, um, they're definitely an awesome tool. If you have something nasty in your water, the first thing you want to do is throw carbon there to pull it out because it will. Absolutely. Um, if your water's Absolutely. yellow, same thing with carbon. But don't put in, you know, a little bit in your reactor. Don't pack it full. Like, mm -hmm. it's better to use, use a couple less. of tablespoons. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's better to use less and then just do it a little more often if you need to, than put a ton in there because it could strip the felt fast. Absolutely, and that's uh, that was one of the things that Ling was saying was that um, a lot of the corals, especially the SPS and also the LTS, they start withdrawing or they start receding, or what we call RTM and STM, if yeah. you actually strip out too much. And once again, carbon does strip out, um, especially if you have a lot of carbon, will strip out the phosphates as well as the nitrates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people will say, no, it doesn't. It does, but it leaches out nitrates a lot faster than it does phosphates until there's buildup. And it, you know, gets packed in with detritus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at some point there's a, um, I want to say, too much of a good thing. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, what we were talking about earlier is uh, sometimes too much candy is bad for you. No, very, very true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but a little bit goes a long way. It makes you feel good, gets your endorphins <laughs> up. You know, especially chocolate for uh, for the ladies. I'm a chocolate fiend too. Halloween's coming. All, all <laughs> just like your reef tank, all is well in moderation. <laughs> Absolutely. So you have to watch what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, and go slow. And remember, carbon also affects. You know, when you add anything into your water that's dry, typically it also disrupts um, our ORP. Mm -hmm. You notice that, Dev, when you throw in a pinch of food, yeah, dry it will food, drop. and all of a sudden you see it. Yeah, you see your ORP drop. Yep. So, so once again, you add anything to your water or your mm -hmm. tank's water that's dry would actually drive the ORP down yep. significantly. So ORP, people think of it, I mean, it, it is a complicated one, but in a sense, it's kind of like the clarity or not the clarity, the cleanliness of your water. Mm -hmm. So every time you feed the tank, you literally watch it drop. And then at nighttime, my mm -hmm. ozone kicks on and it goes whoop back up again. It's like this exactly. little zigzag seesaw cycle. Um, okay, and, so actually here's a good one. And once again, oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go Sorry, ahead. you go first. Oh, yeah. So uh, for those who are listening, ORP is the oxidation reduction potential mm -hmm. of the water, meaning that how, how well can it actually uh, oxidize, you know, like heavy metals, so on and so forth, organics, mm -hmm. and break it down. So that's one of the reasons why we try to tend to keep our ORP at a higher level, uh, especially in a closed system, is you need that breakdown if you're going to be feeding other stuff. So now, like anything, too much ORP is also a bad thing. So I believe Absolutely. they say 450 is like the max you'd ever want to have in a tank. Most mm -hmm. people are like 350 to 400 is a happy range. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's correct. Dave was asking, do you think UV takes too much beneficial nutrients out? I've not used um, UV before, Cruz. So this one's all you. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, was was that question directed at me or at you? That's just in general. But I've never used UV, so I'm just passing it to you. <laughs> um, shoot. It's a multi-faceted uh, piece of equipment. UV also does create some type of ozone. Okay. Um, um, at a molecular level, it will combine. It'll actually oxidize as well, and it also breaks down proteins. Mm -hmm. So when you're running um, too much UV, and it, when I say too much, meaning the dwell time's so long, you have a lot of freaking organics in your water, it could help break it down. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have beneficial good stuff that's going through, and the and the dwell time's bad, you know is. Mm -hmm pretty long and lengthy, you know, through the tortuous chambers or whatnot. Yep. It could kill the beneficial bacteria that's in your water column. Mm -hmm. So it could be too much. So UV, mm -hmm. UV on most hobbyist size ones, it's really dependent on the flow. Too much flow and mm -hmm. it's not going to do anything. Too slow flow and it could potentially kill everything. So it's exactly most of them have a certain rating. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are using it, make sure you're kind of pay attention to that range. Uh, someone else, TMG was asking, or P of the ocean? That's a good question. I do not know. Oh, that's a good one. I'm I sure. don't know. I never took out my ORP meter out there. Me neither. <laughs> I'll hold the apex Look. up to the tide pools next time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's uh, something that we need to do, Dev. I'm curious now, to be honest. I need yeah, a more portable me meter, but the curiosity is definitely peaked. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, so another... Um, Another one I want to touch on is GFO, uh, phosphate yeah. remover. There is gels and resins that do it as well. GFO is probably the most common mm -hmm. one, garnet ferric oxide. Again, mm -hmm. this is one of those ones where too much is bad. Like too much will strip your water so fast, it will strip the good stuff out of the corals as well. And then mm -hmm. you can start to lose your SPS from it. So there's definitely yeah, exactly another one of those whenever i change my gfo i literally have it on just a trickle like it's barely going through there just to do that little tiny bit of filtration extra um so yep. another one you use a teaspoon or two do not pack this big reactor full because it will strip your tank that's yep. a big one absolutely and and also on uh the gfo mm -hmm. oh i hear myself echoing no oh, i'll turn you down a bit okay okay so also uh, in regards to the GFO stripping out a lot of the phosphates, remember that uh, bacteria utilizes both phosphates and nitrates mm -hmm. um, to balance out. So they utilize the, uh, the phosphate to bind the nitrates to also split off the, um, you know, to split off the oxygen molecule. And, uh, you know, the anaerobic bacteria at that point, you know, wherever the anaerobic zone is, and most of the time we don't need it, mm -hmm. you know, it breaks it down into nitrogen and oxygen. So, I mean, once again, you strip uh, phosphates all the way down to zero, and your nitrates start spiking up, and that's one of the things that many people have seen. Mm -hmm. You know, their phosphates are zero, great, they're controlling the green hair algae, but then all of a sudden their nitrates start creeping up exponentially. <laughs> that's, you know. Usually when people are carbon dosing or doing other stuff, I, that's one thing I've mm -hmm. seen many times, actually, where they have GFO, they're using some resin, and if you don't have mm -hmm. phosphates, you're not going to get rid of your nitrates. Correct. So. It's Correct. that 1 to 21, or whatever that Renfield ratio is, that they kind of need to keep in balance yeah. actually work. Yeah. yeah I think uh, they changed it recently, too. I want to say within the last two years. I think it's like 14 to 1. Yeah, that, you're, you're correct on that one. For yeah, 14.7. Yeah. Some, some weird number. But um, uh, I'll leave that to the nerds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, someone was saying, I noticed high-capacity GFO lowers the alkalinity right away within the first 24 hours. Has anyone else noticed this? I'm going to pay attention next uh, time, actually. Un unfortunately, yes, it does react. Mm -hmm. It does react, um, you know, within the first 24 hours until it actually uh, stabilizes. And then once it does, then it starts pulling out the phosphates after that. So. Yeah. Hmm. Good to know. I'm going to actually yeah. pay it. Now that I've got the Elkatronic, actually, I'm going to watch it next time I change it and see if there's a dip or if it changes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, going back to the whole filtration thing, um, you know, chemical and or otherwise, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I hope you don't mind me saying, but that's uh, one of the reasons why we also utilize natural means 
you know, or we try to uh, keep to natural means as much as possible, either utilizing the bacteria to control nutrients, utilizing macroalgae, and uh, the refugium to control, um, you know, excess nutrients and stuff like that. Um, you know, and, you know, with that, you know, we're utilizing, you know, a typical substrate, um, in, in our case over here at Elegant, and everybody has their preference, but we utilize uh, Miracle Mud for our refugiums. Um, and one of the reasons being is that it actually adds back, you know, the necessary minerals and also the, um, I want to say, the necessary chemistry. Trace elements. <laughs> yeah. yeah, chemistry back to the, back to the system. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just take, it also gives. And I think that that's where the power was, was that it didn't only, you know, help the anaerobic and create an anaerobic zone because it defined, uh, defined the substrate especially uh, down below, mm -hmm. but it also creates enough surface area, especially near the top. If you take a look at it, it's very, very granular. Um, back in the day, uh, I believe it was sifted a little bit too fine, and that was one of the things that uh, my mentor um, you know, said, hey, you know what, I realized something. We don't need it that fine. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we have a mixed grade, uh, ah. mixed grade uh, Miracle Mud now. Is this, it's, this uh, is a common. new one? So I, no, I it's, it's, okay. Is it what I have it, in my shed, it, just waiting for me for my new tank? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You have the new. Uh, you have the new stock. Is it? Okay. Is I bought it like a couple yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, you'll notice that it's uh, it's more granular. And okay. I, I know a lot of people noticed that too. Hmm. Is that we didn't sift it, you know, as fine, utilizing a finer screen. We're utilizing a bigger screen, um, you know, to actually allow for you know, the bigger granules to create that surface area. Because yeah. a lot of people are going to the, uh, you know, real reef rock or bare bottom and stuff like that. And we know that bacteria needs that surface area in order to populate and colonize. So on that note, does smaller mm -hmm. versus bigger granules make a big difference for bacteria surface area? Mm -hmm. And aeration and mm -hmm. uh, allowing water to pass through and gas exchange. Because smaller is technically more surface area but bigger is going to let water and gas exchange everything flow through the cracks more right it's a trade -off. correct correct so you're going to have more impaction with smaller and finer particles than you would with larger granules mm -hmm. now just because you mentioned miracle mud i'm curious on mm -hmm. your thoughts running it in trays versus throwing it in a reactor and forcing water through it do you think there's any big difference on the two different methods um there is the ability for you know the microfauna to actually eat and consume some of these uh, I want to call it micro particles of minerals mm -hmm. that they need to actually survive or to, you know to thrive and to benefit from. I mean, if you notice the difference between the gummy um, the gummy uh, vitamins that we're taking versus the old Flintstone ones that are very very crunchy and have mm -hmm. that really really gritty taste, is that you get more of the how do you say it, non water soluble non-water soluble uh, uh, minerals, which uh, a lot of the corals and a lot of invertebrates actually consume. If you take a look at shrimp, for instance, um, you know, that crustacean, you'd mm -hmm. be able to find in their gut a lot of sand and silt. And yeah. it's for a reason. It's not just because, you know, that's where the food is and all they're doing is just digesting the food around it. But the minerals also play a factor in its overall health. You know, part of it is digested, you know, regardless of how small, you know, otherwise, you know, why are we taking gritty, nasty tasting green vitamins sometimes? You know? <laughs> it's point. because those are, those are insoluble, mm -hmm. but your body still is able to utilize it. We have villi that have, you know, in our small intestines, large intestines, yeah. you know, that look very, very similar to the freaking polyps of a coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I fair. mean, <laughs> fair point. and so, I mean, with that, you know, the minerals, and I know that a lot of people have started, uh, well, I've seen a group of people start doing it. They actually mix Miracle Mud in a cup, and then they pour off some of that uh, that floating uh, particulated uh, water that looks almost into, like a Into the cocoa. tank? Into their tank. So I'm going to, actually, there's a comment on that in two seconds, but i got to quickly give a quick shout to K-Town for the 6.99 Super Chat with a comment just because. Thank you very much, K-Town. What, what? <laughs> what, what? Much appreciated, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, on your just question about people pouring in the tank, so Thomas was just asking, how do you feel about periodically making the tank cloudy to mimic runoff from land mass after a heavy rain, which basically <laughs> very similar to what you're just saying, but people doing the same thing with Miracle Mud. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the thing is that the 
you know, corals have polyps for a reason. And that's all I have to say. Corals have polyps for a reason. It's to take in uh, particulates in the water and whatever's landing on their mucus or mm -hmm. their mucus membrane. And then they suck it in. Yeah. You know? And, I mean, I know that people say, oh, well, it sucks in cyclops. Well, okay, that's great. Yeah. It's opportunistic. Almost everything in this, uh, you know, in the ocean is opportunistic. You could have a carnivore that would occasionally graze, and you could have a grazer occasionally eat meat. Mm -hmm. Does I mean, does that make sense? Like some of the tangs, they like the freaking krill. They like, you know, anything meaty. Yeah. And then, when you're not feeding them that, then they go back to grazing. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, variety so, is the spice of life. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly, and it, it, it's what we think as, um, you know, as a balance in diet, even though they're predominant and herbivorous, or, or you know, omnivorous and or carnivorous. You know, they each omnivore have a carnivore. period in time. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> omnivore, carnivore, herbivore. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a period in time where the younger the younger of the species eats more meat and more protein in mm -hmm. order to get that growth spurt. And then as they grow older, they start grazing more and more on the vegetation, so on and so forth. So, it, you know, their diet changes. And that's one of the things that we notice with some of our bigger tanks is that, yeah, they still have a taste for an occasional meaty, meaty mm -hmm. bite. But most of the time, they're trying to find, you know, nice big chunks of, you know, seaweed. Yeah. Um, another, actually, speaking of food, seaweed nori, I don't know if how many people you guys feed it, but I feed it to my tank every single day, sometimes twice a day. And mm -hmm. if you guys are having only filtration, usually you got to put a little more good stuff into the tank to feed the fish. TMG, 199 mm -hmm. Super Chat, since I can't buy you a beer. <laughs> I'll go get one. <laughs> just, just one. Thanks, buddy. That's like half a beer here. But thank you. <laughs> I will enjoy that half a beer. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thanks, p <PNG>. Awesome. <laughs> yep. Um, so, okay. Another question. With your saying, so people will take the... Everyone likes the longer stream. <laughs> so, okay. Saying, so some people will take the... Which I'm going to call it? Like Miracle Mud or Mix Up the Sand or whatever mm -hmm. and get that particulate in there. Is, do you mm -hmm. think so? Do you see that as coral food, or do you see it as potential issues if those particles are settling down on the corals? If maybe you don't have enough flow or something, could that be an issue? No. Uh, um. Yes and no, and it could be uh, taken both ways. If you're utilizing, uh, for instance, microbubbling, yep, the microbubbling will be able to help the coral shed off that excess mucus with those particulates in it, allowing the membrane to be free again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, better better ion transport, so on and so forth, uh, across the sodium potassium pumps in the membrane. It's the only active, you know, from what, when I studied biology, the sodium potassium pumps are one of the biggest, um, I want to say the mechanisms in membrane trans, uh, transportation of ions from the water. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to keep those membranes clean. With the micro scrubbing or the micro bubbling or the bubbling, uh, however you want to call it, it allows the mucus to actually, you know, lift up and out instead of just slough off and land at the base of the coral. Mm -hmm. um, so we notice that, you know, in a lot of tanks with low flow and no enhanced bubbling or no enhanced flow with the mm -hmm. bubbling, is that you start getting STN on the bottom of the coral or yeah. the coral colony because it's getting suffocated. From not enough flow. Exactly. Not enough flow. The bubbles enhance it, allows the freaking corals to slime a little bit more. The bubbles get caught in the freaking mucus, and mm -hmm. the mucus gets more buoyant. Yeah. And then it lifts it up and off. Makes sense. Okay. Um, one, one more quick show at Rogue Aquariums, because he gave me a super chat a couple minutes ago. Thank you. Well, well, I got a full <laughs> beer, yes. <laughs> I got a full beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, okay. So flow, uh, on the outside mm -hmm. of filtration, adding all this extra stuff, mm -hmm. flow is mm -hmm. its own topic in a whole nother stream, mm -hmm. but it definitely mm -hmm. makes a big difference. Um, not enough flow is one of the things that can suffocate corals like we we're talking about. If mm -hmm. you, you are stirring it up, getting these particles on it, if they can't get off of the mm -hmm. coral, for instance, or they're sitting and settling on something, it could potentially suffocate it. Mm -hmm. Or same thing if it's the mucus built up. Okay, quick, quick, mm -hmm. quick summarizing on it. Okay, yep. absolutely. And uh, not only that, but a lot of people don't like the green, the green on the glass, the algae or the or a slightly tinged water. They want yeah. like super crystal clear all the time. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that that algae, you know, the single celled algae also is being produced by, you know, if you do have a refugium or any other uh, particulate matter that could actually spawn 
the uh, the phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. You're stripping all that out with filter socks mm -hmm. and or filter rollers and yep. or you know the skimmer if you're running it uh, you know if you're running it 24/7. So that phytoplankton that you work so hard <laughs> to produce or that you want to produce in your tank, you know you're you're basically stripping that out as well. So what what size? Do you know what particle size or roller size, filter size sock would actually strip out phytoplankton? Like would a 200, 100, or would all of them strip it out? Um, being that fibers are even more microscopic than just the thread themselves, it can catch onto a lot of these odd shaped, you know, sharp cornered type of uh, single celled algae. Mm -hmm. Or the ones that actually have like, you know, the tails or the modal, you know, being able to swim through the water as well. And uh, yeah, they, they would get caught up. And once again, impaction. Once you get that first initial layer of, of uh, I want to say, any type of film on your filter socks, it starts working better. Once you have a film on it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, that makes sense, And I that's guess. what a lot of people are seeing. You know, It's kind of like uh, you know, going back to the whole yeast. Once you get that initial layer on the actual filter sock mm -hmm. um, or strainer or whatnot, uh, especially in the beer industry, Mm -hmm. Once you get that first layer, it's what we call coating um, on the filter. Yeah. After you get that first coating or that impaction, then everything else after that comes out crystal clear. Mm -hmm. So once you get that, yeah, pretty much everything else gets caught and tangled and tangled and stripped out. Um, so speaking of all the filtering, I got another another kind of question for you. So yeah. with what's what do you think like carbon versus ozone for clearing up the water? Hmm. That's Dave, a good question. Normat, thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. Um, I would say I tend to utilize and tend to gravitate towards the ozone or hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. uh, for those who, who, you know, utilizing another expensive piece of machinery on their system. We yeah. like to keep it simple. Dosers are very, very cheap now. Uh, I remember in the days. You know, back in the days when those dosers were about five, six hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Now you can pick one up, you know, a decent one like a camera or whatnot, for probably about ninety nine or yeah. a dolphin or for four or heads on it and exactly. Uh huh. And it has a timer, it has a doser, it's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd rather utilize that. Okay. So I have a buddy and he doses peroxide H two O two on his doser mm -hmm. every single day. Do because you but where mentioned... is he putting it? It's Where somewhere in a it? sump. Um, I think in a return chamber, but or could be in the refrigerator. But either way, I know he doses it in his tank. Because you mentioned that as one of mm -hmm. the ways. Because, I mean, this is essentially like running a tiny ozone in a way, right? Mm-hmm. So and I'm just, oxidizer. Yeah, I'm just yep. curious. Like, because I know he claims it gets rid of all his algae, right? I've never tried. I've spot treated with it. I've never dosed it, though. Mm-hmm. Just we uh, we t yeah we typically dose our hydrogen peroxide and or our ozone directly into the skimmer intake the air intake. It's it's the best place to actually export a lot of the uh, I want to say oxidized bacteria because uh, hydrogen peroxide reacts uh, uh, with the catalase in the bacterial membrane, mm -hmm. and that catalase actually causes the bacteria to lyse, causes the membrane to harden first, and then it lyses, which is explode. And the best place to actually export that exploded bacteria with all the nutrients that it consumes is right at the skimmer. So why wouldn't you want to do it there instead yeah. of just haphazardly broadcasting into the entire system? No, exactly. No. So. I, I agree. It's something I don't know if I would feel comfortable dosing every day, but I just heard you mention no. it. I know he does it, so I was curious. Yeah, well, I, we, we do in some of our systems probably about one to two mils a day. In, and I'm talking about these systems are about 120, 150. Yeah, that's good. So, and it, and it's at the skimmer, so it's not going to affect anything else. And you know, once it reacts with the catalase in the bacteria or the catalase within any membrane, you know, be it a phytoplankton or whatnot, any mm -hmm. other organic uh, material, it's pretty much neutralized at that point. And breaks down into the O, uh, the radical O, and then also the H2O molecule. Yep. Okay, so two two quick questions I want to get to because they, they scroll by a couple minutes ago. Uh, this is a question for Cruz. Why do you think a tank that needs heavy complex filtration, i.e. GFO skimmer, is f a flawed tank? Do you believe a healthy tank is an organic tank, i.e. macro LG filtration? 
Yeah, well, you know, going back to the whole thing and the whole point of trying to go as natural as possible, utilizing um, macro as opposed to chemical mean, mm -hmm. is that macro allergies are particular and selective in what nutrients they pull out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and it, and it won't utilize uh, every, every last bit of nitrates and or phosphates or any other dissolved uh, nutrients in the water. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that if it's not getting enough, part of it dies, and then it releases some more nutrients back into the water. So it's more, of a, more or less a natural cycle of balance. If there's not enough food and not enough uh, nutrients in the water, you'll notice that your Kato starts, uh, your Kato macroalgae or whatnot, will stop accelerating in growth and density. Mm -hmm. And it slows down, which yeah. means that now it's no longer taking in the amount of nutrients to actually repair mm -hmm. a lot of its organic uh, tissue. No. One other thing, too, is it takes slightly different mm -hmm. types of organics as well, right? Like if you have, say, mm -hmm. a skimmer versus algae, they're both going to take slightly different types of organics out of the water. Mm -hmm. And once again, the skimmer, uh, typically, you know, once again, it's called a protein fractionator, mm -hmm. will tend to take out more proteins out of the water. And those proteins typically are the things that feed the detritivores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Um, so you don't, uh, and typically in the whole Miracle Mud way and the ecosystem aquarium way, hmm. is to only run your skimmer as minimal as possible depending on load. It's almost like dosing, but reverse dosing. You're taking out the least amount to keep your water clear, to keep your you know, tank and uh, your aquarium oxygenated as well, because it does do that partially hmm. if you're taking in fresh air. And not only that, but uh, you know, you know, once again, it's uh, a skimmer is non-discriminatory, meaning that it will pull out whatever the heck it can. Yeah, it's true. Uh, whereas the mac whereas the macroalgae is very, very selective mm -hmm. on what it could actually pull out. Yep. No, nope, very true. Um, that's a good point. I never considered that, but yeah, yeah it, it doesn't care. It takes out whatever it wants to attach to those bubbles. Yeah, and uh, same thing with the chemical. You know, anything chemical, resin based, they're non-discriminatory. Yep. Uh, I know that they say, oh, well, it only pulls out this, but we notice that it also pulls out silicates, too. Mm -hmm. And some of the silicates are what, uh, you know, some of the sponges, cold spongia or whatnot, utilize to actually build the rigidity in their, you know, in their systems. So if you're running, you know, some type of resin base and you're pulling out silicates as well as phosphates, you know, and a lot of phosphates also pull down silicate levels or phosphate removers remove uh, silicates as well, you notice that your sponges start deteriorating and become droopy. That's true. And, sp and having sponges in your tank is an excellent sign that your tank is healthy and doing well. It's usually Correct. a more established tank by the time you start to get that sponge growth. So they're yeah, a good sign. That's what we call the, yep, the lightning sponge or <laughs> some, <laughs> some other uh, you know, wild streaking sponge that comes on a lot of the live rock. So yeah, it's, uh, it's also a good indicator. You know, once you start seeing the tissue deteriorating that you're pulling out a little bit too much silicates yep. you know, with, along with your phosphates. No, very true. Um, Tense Tree Reef was asking a couple minutes ago, how do you maintain salinity after turning your skimmer on and off for extended periods of time since the sump level changes? If... Oh, it does... Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I'll let it, you. If your skimmer is, like, a reasonable size for the tank, like, it will change your water levels a bit, but it shouldn't be a massive difference. Not enough to cause a swing, I wouldn't think, unless you had some crazy oversized skimmer. Mm -hmm. Okay, go. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was going to touch on is okay. uh, typically, you know, a well-tuned skimmer is at a certain height. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer tries to tell you the certain hold-up volume that it would actually take, you know, um, into it at certain flow flow rates. Mm -hmm. And, you, I mean, I've seen people just run their freaking skimmers like crazy, you know, pumps on full blast, even though they have the freaking DC pump on. Mm -hmm. And they think that they're doing something good, but they're also, you know, imbalancing the water at that point or the water level. And it sucks up so much. And if you don't have it in the water, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, at the prescribed depth, then you'll start seeing this huge rise in the water column inside your skimmer. Yep. And then once you turn it off, it'll drop back down, raise your friggin', uh, you know, raise your water level in the return pump section, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the most stable level, you yep. know, in your uh, in your sump system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so salinity. Um, yeah, if you set it up correctly, and you know, once again, that's arbitrary, 
it depends on what skimmer you've got. It depends on the sump size. Um, it also depends on how much, uh, you know, how much total water volume that you have. Salinity should not be an issue if everything is sized correctly. Mm -hmm. It's all a, it's all about application and what you're trying to do. And I yep. keep on trying to drive that point. If you're raising a softy tank, do you need to balance your calcium all the time? Absolutely not. Your alkalinity, mm -hmm. eh, every once in a while. But uh, yeah, but if you're having SPS, everybody's all over it. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You're testing like fiends every Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On, you made a very good something. I need to put this out there. Uh, salinity. Check it once in a while. I recently mm -hmm. lost a couple acros in my tank due to RTN. And I'm highly suspicious it was because my salinity was way lower than it shouldn't have been. Because guess what? I haven't tested it in months. And it slowly crept on me. And it caught up to me. So I'm willing to guess that most people that have had a tank for a long time don't test salinity nearly enough. So add that to your list. Give it a quick check once in a while. Make Absolutely. Sure Did it uh, raise a little bit too high, Dev? It raised. It dropped too low. Oh. I uh, know. Wow. Yep. That that's interesting because I was going to say it could also go the other way. See. Where you're dosing all these other salts mm -hmm. into your system, like borate, and you know, like uh, borate salts, some other you know magnesium chlorides, potassium chlorides, I you know iodides, mm -hmm. so on and so forth that actually dissolves in there. And it actually skews the overall salinity of your system, especially yep. if you're dosing every day. Mm -hmm. No, so. exactly. But yeah, no, it, it was on the low side, and I it's my own fault. I haven't tested in months, but it was a good lesson to myself to remind myself to actually check it once in a while. Hard lesson. I hate yeah. losing stuff, but I had two, yeah. two SPS RTN on me, and it was... My salinity dropped to 1.023, which is way too low for corals. They do not, they're not happy there. Corals are happier if you're a little bit on the high side, but not on the low side. So, um, okay. what, One other tip to throw out there, too, if you guys are doing something to boost your salinity back up, if you have fish in there, don't do it more than 0.2 a day. Um, fish do mm -hmm. not like big swings. They can handle a drop more than they can handle an increase. So it's a little tip. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. If it's you know higher, make sure you don't go more than 0.2 over 24 hours or spread it out over a few days if you have to get something back up there correct and also uh, you're uh, you reminded me something uh, regarding fast removal or rapid removal of uh, phosphates basically mm -hmm. there's got to be a certain concentration in the water around the corals because they have phosphates in it and remember things go from a an area of high concentration to low concentration mm -hmm. if you change that too rapidly it will suck out the phosphates that your coral is utilizing or has utilized, yep. um, you know, for their energy, and uh, you know, it goes back to the whole biology thing where you had uh, I didn't sign, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, ATP and ADP, which are the little energy packets. As those phosphates are released, what is that you exactly? Know, it's ADP and ATP. Is that a brand or is it like a thing? Like I have no idea no, what that no, is. What is it? No, <laughs> well, in uh, biology, that's how you know photosynthesis happens. Okay. So it changes ADP into ATP. So it utilizes the phosphates during photosynthesis and takes it up and becomes adenosine triphosphates. Mm -hmm. At night, when it's utilizing it for energy or during any time during metabolism, it changes the ATP, the stored energy, back into ADP, which is adenosine diphosphates. Mm -hmm. So instead of having three molecules of phosphates, now you have two molecules of phosphate, and the coral could actually utilize that energy from breaking that bond. OK. Hmm. Good to know. So. Um, For those who want to geek out with me. <laughs> I appreciate the odd geek outs. I learn lots. Um, quick disresponsive question. Somebody was asking, oh, ATP, and adenoase triphosphate. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, hit them thumbs up. Appreciate it. If you guys enjoy it, smash that like button. Um, one semi-non-related question, but Francisco was mm -hmm. asking how I keep the trigger fish and the red shrimp together. Uh, it's a blue mm -hmm. throat, blue jaw, blue throat trigger fish. They're one of the more reef safe triggers. I've actually never really had an issue with him. Um, I did lose mm -hmm. a starfish one time. He lost some limbs, which I suspect it was a trigger. I have no idea. But yeah, I have two big fire shrimp. Never been an issue. Nice. At least in this tank. Thanks for hanging out, Dave. Um, yep. I think we Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I think we cut. Oh, Dave Nano Tank also said to say hi a few minutes ago. That was scroll by to say hi. hi yeah. <laughs> I see these in the side of my mind, but I don't want to interrupt if we're getting to something good. So. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. Yeah. 
I enjoy the uh, the interruptions every once in a while. I get long winded. <laughs> ah, that's good I though. Do, but... It's a good tangent. So I like it. <laughs> yep, Sherry's, Re Tina, Lisa's, Tidal Gardens, Reefer G's, Francisco. Lots of people in the chat mm. today. The chat is happening. I have to keep scrolling back up to get uh, back to the questions. Excellent. <laughs> oh, one more thing. Mm -hmm. One more thing about uh, packing in your corals too, or letting them actually grow into full-size colonies. Yep. Is that they become a nutrient export as well. Mm -hmm. Nope, very true. So you know they're not just corals that you know that are just sitting there pretty. They're also utilizing up a lot of the nutrients in your system. So if you have a very very densely populated tank, there's times where our nitrates are very very low and our phosphates are very very low, and we have to artificially dose it back in and or crumble up some food. You know, and let the uh, the little pods digest everything as well as the bacteria to break it down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes we utilize the sea chem products. Sometimes we utilize another nitrate uh, adder, or sometimes ammonium hydroxide as well. Just feed the tank. To, absolutely, absolutely. Your fish will be happy. That so. I don't know. I um actually one of the <laughs> worldwide videos they feed their tank hourly. I only feed mine twice a day, three times on the special day, but mm -hmm. they're lucky. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, one of the things in regards to uh, to uh, heavy filtration is that you tend to feed more, and uh, especially when you have a very, very densely populated SPS tank uh, that we have, and I'm going to be speaking from experience um, and my opinion, is that we have a very, very you know high feeding rate as well, mm -hmm. but then we also have a high dissolved nutrient export. So we feed solids, export a lot of the uh, dissolved nutrients. So a yep. lot of the nitrates and phosphates are taken up by a lot of the macroalgae that we have. Mm -hmm. nope. So you could do it either way. You could feed heavy and still get the colors of the SPS that you want because we notice that when you feed the corals, they do a lot better and they look a lot better and yep. they develop deep, 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 rich colors. Whereas if you know, you're feeding sparingly, we notice a more pastel looking coral. Well, that's more like the Zeovit thing where corals are on like half stress <coughs> bonus where they get those super pastel mm -hmm. colors so yeah. a, a lot of people i mean it's it's I, pretty yeah i mean <laughs> it does pretty. look pretty but it's also like riding the edge right you're like am i gonna yep, push you're it riding, too far yep, and kill my corals my tank i don't know Pers personally exactly. i i've never worried too much about nutrients like for nitrate and phosphates mm -hmm. as long as the corals are colorful and look good i don't have algae mm -hmm. liver who cares um so i feel some people <laughs> stress too much trying to get the nitrates and everything else low so yeah. Well, I mean, kind of like uh, what Sanjay said and uh, a lot of these other experienced reefers is that sometimes you can run nitrates and phosphates a little bit higher mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, without uh, adverse effects, you know, especially uh, if you do have that uptake. Yeah. Because even though you have those high nutrients, it's being utilized as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Someone was asking, will mud help battle di dinos? Hmm. Not directly, no. No. Mm -mm, unfortunately. Yep. Otherwise, I would have wrote about it a long time ago. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish. <laughs> yeah, there'd be the, the oh, miracle, oh, miracle uh, cure the for all. Silver bullet. Yeah, the silver bullet. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not into making false claims about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I I live science every day at uh, at my work, so I have to maintain my. Uh, <laughs> You know, maintain my integrity on that one. Yeah, that's fair. They're completely off topic, but I just noticed there's green text on my shirt, and I can see the reef tank through it through a green screening. It up. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> just a You're small, hollow man. Just a small text yeah. on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hollow man, hollow man dev. Yep, you know. <laughs> okay, so we we went over chemical filtration, mechanical skimmers, ozone. Um, ozone mineralization yep some people are scared of ozone too much mm -hmm. is obviously trouble but it mm -hmm. is beneficial in small amounts yep so i mean we like to go slow yep. we like to go slow as well mm -hmm. bare minimum um so sherry was just saying bacteria imbalance i thought what was that one too not quite sure on the pre half of that one might be dinos oh uh, i think um when i was talking about it it was the uh filter filtering out the beneficial bacteria out of the water column. Yep. Which, I mean, you could be. If you're yeah. using, like, bio pellets or other certain things, right, that's going to grow that bacteria, and you want to skim that out of it. Right? So it mm -hmm. also depends what you're, what you're after. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why, 
you know, you're growing it right there by the skimmer too. Yeah. You usually put it next to the skimmer intake. Mm -hmm. um, if you're actually looking for colonization throughout your tank, you also have to be able to propagate it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Propagate so, the bacteria? You know, yeah, propagate the bacteria all mm -hmm. back into the system because bacteria gets old, you know, they get old. Mm -hmm. And then if certain nutrients aren't available or they keep on getting filtered out, you know, as it's cycling through, because it does go through what we would call a benthic stage as well as a, uh, oh, what is it called? A sedentary, you know, where it actually just settles out and starts, uh, you know, populating the surface. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, a lot of the people, you know, they, they try to breed a lot of things or, you know, like shrimp. They have uh, uh, pelagics, you know, the pelagic stage, the free swimming stage. Um, bacteria also has that when they're trying to repopulate or recolonize something. So if those get into the water and you're filtering it out and skimming it out, you could also prevent it from being able to recolonize in a more beneficial area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why you have the bio balls, you have the bio blocks, um, you know, the marine. Uh, the, is it marine pure? Yeah, marine, marine pure. pure blocks. Giving yeah. your bacteria so. some options. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Give it the uh, areas that are more optimal for growth and uh, repopulation. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's not, you know, if you know, if I talk about miracle mud, we utilize other products too. It's not just mm -hmm. all about one product. It's how you utilize them together and understanding mm -hmm. the synergy between all the different products. It's not all one brand either, yep. you know, and I'm not forcing that on anyone. And uh, I really hope that nobody feels that way. Mm -hmm. So um, Bubba was just asking, how much bacteria should we replace per year, nitrifying versus denitrifying? I don't think you necessarily need to replace it. I think it doesn't hurt to add in some every once in a while because you're introducing different strains that might not currently be in your tank. So there could be some benefits to that. Mm -hmm. But your system, yep. once it's cycled and running, I mean, it does have those nitrifying, denitrifying bacteria in it. So it's mm -hmm. really just adding more diversity to your system if you were to add a bottle of some of the random ones, like, you know, yep. Fritz's Turbo yep. Starter, Dr. Tim's, or any of the various other yeah. ones once in a while. See, the one, uh, the one thing that I do lean towards Dr. Tim's primarily is the mm -hmm. waste away. Yeah. Um, the other ones are, you know, the nitrogen consuming but once again you need phosphates for it to actually consume the nitrates mm -hmm. so when people are you know you have that imbalance already it's hard for the bacteria to take up those nitrates um, going back to the bacteria the reason why we utilize waste away especially in our dinoflagellate regimen is because it's a macrophage type of bacteria macrophage meaning big mouth um, and it would actually consume the dinoflagellates because it's smaller than it hmm. on a cellular level Yep. And, you know, once you propagate that, a lot of people noticed, you know, with the aeration, with the additional aeration, with the carbon dosing, those macrophage bacteria do multiply very, very quickly and can overtake the dinos. That's one of the reasons why we posted up that, uh, that regimen. Yep. And once, once the macrophage bacteria consumes the dinos, now it releases the, uh, the nitrates and phosphates of the dinoflies that we're actually utilizing because, once again, they are photosynthetic. Mm -hmm. So you need the other one, the, uh, well, we utilize Dr. Tim's one and only. Yeah. And uh, we, we wrote that in, in order to take up the excess nitrates and phosphates. So, so beating we dinos build up with those two. Beating mm -hmm. dinos, to, that's actually answering two questions, one. So beating dinos with bacteria, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then utilizing the, nit uh, the uh, denitrifying bacteria, or I want to say the nitrate consuming bacteria. Um, you know, to prevent green hair algae outbreaks after you can be, you know, after you defeat the dinos. Mm -hmm. Because now they're no longer a population to actually utilize the excess nutrients. Yeah. Hmm. Makes sense. So, okay, so I never know how to say your name properly. D Dianthicus Stantius Reef. Eventually, one strain mm -hmm. will take over, leaving it prone to a single stressor to wipe out, to wipe out you find from a lack Perfect. of diversity. So the more strange, Correct. the better for stability standpoint. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And the thing is that, and I know that we don't go over everything that uh, Elegant Corals and myself personally do, but mm -hmm. we do dose it probably quarterly a year mm -hmm. with new strains of bacteria at the same balance, utilizing carbon dosing to actually increase the freaking population, turning off the skimmer at that time, and turning on the bubbler to increase the bacterial population to settle out evenly. Mm -hmm. So... So, yeah, 
it's uh, multi multifaceted. So every six months a year, when you add more bacteria, do you do the same one all the time, or do you mix it up and add different ones? We uh, we add the waste away and the okay. one and only. Okay. Because the one and only, and uh, let me get back to that. The one and only actually does have a dormant state, which is the anaerobic state. It mm -hmm. doesn't consume as much. So if your oxygen levels are low, it goes into a state of stupor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it kind of sleeps. It kind of sleeps. It doesn't do much. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and that's one of the reasons why people go, oh, well, I dosed this and nothing happened. You know, yeah. so, you know, basically oxygen is also another igniter, especially in metabolism. If you have high oxygen levels, the aerobic form of the Dr. Tim's one and only is very, very voracious at consuming the nitrates, provided that the, uh, the phosphates are also balanced. Yeah. So, so if you have a green hair algae outbreak, we typically dose very, very slowly the phosphates if it's near zero. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully we could actually start tipping the balance towards the bacteria, you know, for, you know, three, four days um, in our regimen. We typically say three days and then turn on the skimmer at that point to start sucking out a lot of the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. It's a good way to do it. Variety mm -hmm. is the spice of life. And that goes for bacteria as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, bacteria really is what is actually filtering our fish tanks at the end of the day, right? We have all this stuff in there, but at the end of the day, it is that little bacteria mm -hmm. strains that are breaking down the gearmonas, gear nitrates, your nitrites to mm -hmm. everything else. So, mm -hmm. And a lot of people mention that they have dust looking things in their sump or in the corner of certain uh, areas or in their sand bed. It's a very, very fine, fine powder. Mm -hmm. That's the bacteria, the dead bacteria. Yeah. So every once in a while, we do also stir up our sand bed if we have a sand bed. Yep. And, you know, we're aerating at the same time, so we're not suffocating anything. You know, it's getting floated out into the sump, into mm -hmm. our filter socks, do you, and we're removing it from that point. Do you mix up the whole sand bed or just a small portion of it at a time? Small portion at a time, and uh, that's where uh, Lorenzo came in. And we we're like, yeah. But he actually turned it into a regimen. You know, Lorenzo's uh, one of my buddies over there in Alabama. He's a welder. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we started talking about, can we regiment this? And he goes, yep. yeah. He goes, we could divide it into four sections, do 25% at a time. Yep. It's so, called the uh, Lorenzo White, <laughs> White Sands Method. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So yeah, he's uh, one, of, uh, one of the reefers that I came to know early on okay, in the so, hobby as well. So vacuum a sand bed versus just mixing it up. Ah. <sighs> Vacuuming the sand bed and passing it through a filter sock is very, very similar to doing the same thing or, as uh, just stirring it up. Mm -hmm. So what, what about water change? Just vacuum a chunk of your sand bed every time or leave it alone. What do you think is more beneficial long term? I think uh, vacuuming it out and uh, passing it through a filter sock back into the sump area is uh, beneficial as well. But what, <laughs> but what about taking it out and not putting it back into your system? Just straight up vacuuming mm -hmm. it out and getting rid of all those particles. You can, but then once again, you imbalance a lot of the, uh, I want to call it the chemical bounces between the inside of the membranes of anything, okay. anything alive in your tank and the water itself, because now it's devoid of anything. No, that's fair. I, I was waiting for, I knew you had a deeper answer. So, um, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's good. I was curious. T65 gallon 199 super chat. Thank you very much, sir. Much appreciated. Awesome. Awesome. I love science. Yes. For science. <laughs> I geek out on this a bit. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if I get carried away, tell me to slow down. <laughs> nah, I, I like it. Uh, oh, just... yeah, you could replay it over and over and over again. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm just giving quick to the comments, make sure I'm not missing anything. It would be interesting seeing the rate of bacteria strain turnover while introducing frags from multiple sources, specifically probability of taking hold, probability likely of the same stressor wipeout. That would be a tricky one to actually try and monitor that. Sorry, my dog's a little excited out there. It is. And that's one of the reasons why we cause a bacterial bloom, you know, because mm -hmm. the bacteria that you want, you know, in those bottles are pure strain, more or less, especially the one and only. And also the, um, you know, for the most part, I want to say it's 99.99%, <laughs> you know, one strain. Yeah. But you also you also get the off batch, as we call it, mm -hmm. the off batch um, uh, bacteria. So. Those are what we call infections, and it happens yeah. in uh, wastewater water treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, one second, my, my kids are out. Oh, yeah, no problem. 
So yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, you know inducing that bacterial bloom actually does force out some of these other rogue uh, type of bacterial strains that you get from other people's tanks, and we like to dose the bacteria every time we add new frags or new colonies, especially maricultures from the wild um, into our systems. Really. Uh, you know, just to reestablish a balance of the bacteria that we know, it's mm -hmm. uh, how do you say it? I've never considered that. It, it, it's a known uh, stable, yeah. localized-ish source of the tank. Mm -hmm. yep. Exactly. So you could you could actually you know kind of like how you take probiotics, right? Yep. And you know, you may eat something that causes it to turn you know upside down or you drink water from Mexico or something mm. and it turns your whole insides like into like blah, <laughs> like yuck. <Yeah. laughs> so in order to actually defeat it you take a ton of freaking probiotics as well as take some of the uh, I want to say um, the, sh the stuff that kills the other uh, the flagellates or dinoflagellates um, in that fresh water and they're typically a type of uh, parasite right mm -hmm. it stays in your gut causes you to feel sick puts out toxins endotoxins and uh, yeah, the only way to freaking balance that out is to take more probiotics and then to also kill it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you utilize an anti, anti something or other. Um, you I've, take those pills that the doctors prescribe. I've never considered that about adding new frags and corals to a tank though. It's an interesting outlook on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm, we're, we're always playing the probability game in the reefing hobby, right? Yep. <laughs> True, yes, <laughs> so yes, we if are. You know, so if you know that you have a high population of one thing, it typically outcompetes any other smaller colonies, mm -hmm. right? Yep. True. Like, I would like to go into a war with a large army than three people, you know, at the Alamo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a big army of bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. So I mean, they're 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 your friends. They're your uh, you know they're your regiment. They're your infantry. Yep, they it's take true. Care of our system. That's what keeps everybody happy. Uh, a few minutes ago, sorry I missed this one earlier. Someone was asking about no using thoughts on using no pox to control algae. Uh, so no pox is carbon dosing, and by dosing mm -hmm. no pox or vodka or vinegar or sugars, they're all basically doing the same thing. Um, you're mm -hmm. feeding a bacteria strain that is going to help eat your nitrates and your phosphates. Yep. So, can, um, can I go? go yeah, for can it. I throw a side note? Sure can. Okay, a side note into that is while we're dosing no pox, we also throw in the you know the bacteria that we like. Mm -hmm. So as you're dosing that, yeah. you're starting to populate you know with the carbon dosing populate that particular strain. So you're, you can actually force out them all the other, mm -hmm. um, I want to call them alien to that system. So you're, you're beefing up whatever bacteria strains you're adding so you get more good benefit. Hmm, that's, that's a smart Correct. One. I like it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, somebody else was asking where they can find the carbon dosing regimen we're talking about. If you just Google carbon dosing, there, go to Google Images, there's about 8 bazillion different things of it, and it mm -hmm. kind of gives you a thing saying for your tank size, if it's vodka or if it's vinegar start with like you know week one on a 25 mm -hmm. gallon tank it's like 0 0.1 of a millimeters and you do yeah. that then after a week you know maybe you go up to 0 0.2 then maybe you go the biggest thing to mm -hmm. say if you're going to do carbon dosing start slow very low mm -hmm. amount and take your time if you rush it bad things happen yeah. so just start and go Absolutely. very very slow and okay. don't forget to aerate mm -hmm. you need fresh air yeah. um I don't know how to drive that point even further, but even though we're taking in fresh air as well, uh, we also pass it through a, carb, uh, a CO2 to scrubber, you know, mm -hmm. the scrubbing media, yep. the soda lime and or the litho lime, mm -hmm. you know, the rebreathers that we utilize for scuba. I uh, actually have one of those on right now, diving. just to see. It made a little bit of a difference, not a huge one. I have yeah. a part partial but air going like, Yeah, kind of like uh, what Mike, uh, Mike Coletto is always saying, any incremental change for the benefit mm -hmm. is another step forward. Yep. Exactly. Um, so because, uh, you know, like, uh, what was that one song? Uh, I would walk 500 miles. I would walk, yeah. <laughs> and it always starts <laughs> with a single <laughs> step, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it always starts off with a single step. Yeah, baby steps that up. Okay, on that mm -hmm. note, since you just reminded me of it, carbon dosing does, as that bacteria population grows, they're taking the oxygen out of your water, which means more CO2. So that's why we're really stressing that if you do do that, you need to be supplementing it. Whether it's, you know, boosting more air through your skimmer, 
ideally you know if it's summertime open a window and just let fresh air around your tank if possible mm -hmm. having a little line running outside and hooking up to your scammers air intake makes a huge difference for getting rid of that co2 and driving out of the water in your tank um micro bubbling uh, Cruz and i both have videos and stuff on that um, essentially you're injecting little tiny nano bubbles into your tank so if you can do that with fresh air as well it's just all different ways to help get oxygen in and get rid of the co2 in your tank which raises your ph right. and keeps your fish everyone happy driving out that co2 mm -hmm. Yep, and it relinearizes uh, your alkalinity levels. Your pH will reflect what your alkalinity is. Mm -hmm. So having that oxygen in there also makes your alkalinity a little bit more readable. Yeah. And because uh, I know a lot of people that they they told me <laughs> that they had their DKH all the way up to 9.2, but their pH is all the way down to 8.0 or 7.8. And I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, that's huge. You know, it's a huge drop where it should be. You know, when it's normalized. Um, and I bring it up normalized, meaning natural oxygen saturation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it helps out uh, with you being able to see and read what your tank is doing, you know, your utilization rate, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, having that fresh air line, you know, during the bacterial blooms, et cetera, while you're actually, you know, removing certain uh, elements and minerals you know, utilizing the DI resins, um, you got to be careful because it also strips out and degasses the oxygen as well. It rips yep. it apart, lets it, the oxygen degas, which you're already low on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. supplement it however you do it. Mm -hmm. You can never have too much air. And the one other thing to consider, and at least I know in my tank, I'm OCD about making it quiet. So all my drops mm -hmm. in my sump are like an inch. There's hardly anything. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, there's like big things. You got your waterfalls going on. That's going to promote a lot of oxygen, oxygenation mm -hmm. and gas exchange. Yeah. Um, lots of surface rippling, right? That surface tension is going to promote gas exchange. But in mm -hmm. the ever going quest, at least for me, for like a dead quiet system, you're also sacrificing some of that oxygen exchange. So it's good to have all these other methods like your skimmer, outside air, micro bubbling, all that stuff kind of helps balance it back out again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, all in all, from uh, from my point of view, can you over skim? Can you over filter? Absolutely. Yep. And when you're actually doing a lot of the resin filters, remember that you're also degassing some of the most uh, vital, you know, nutrients and or gas that's uh, supposed to be in your system. Because nope. we also notice when we put the, you know, those uh, resins or the filtration resins in there, once again, ORP goes down and so does the DO. We also have a DO meter on our system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just monitoring is, uh, gosh, I forgot what it was called. I'll take a picture of it and send it to you, Duff. Okay, but yeah, good. there's it's a cheaper. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not that expensive. Um, yeah. I want to say probably about 300, 300 okay. bucks. So, you know, in comparison to the other ones that are attached to a system, those are about 600 bucks, so half yeah. price. So do you notice any big trends or stuff with the DO meter from anything you're doing on the tank? Like, has it changed or gave you any more insight on anything? Um, it does, especially during the, uh, the hot, hot summertime, you know, when we're trying to keep all the cold air in, um, you know, we also, uh, and I'm going to give you a little, a little cheat. Okay. Um, we put it through a, an ice cooler, you know, the air intake tube, yep. pass it through, you know, an, an ice chest, an igloo, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. or, you know, an otter box, uh, cooler. And we put the ice in there and let the tube run through it right the air intake and it cools mm -hmm. down the air as well so you can actually pull in hot summer air into your system and still be able to get the benefits of drawing in cooler fresh air oh, interesting nice and, and during the winter time when it's like friggin uh you know especially up north uh where i am at and where deb's at mm -hmm. you could also wrap some of these you know because it's only air you could actually run the copper tube around your um the exhaust stack of your water heater mm-hmm and it could also warm it up that way. Yeah. Warm cold air. Yeah, so two or true. three wraps, yep. and you're good. Nope, not to do it. Uh, yep. What size tank is this? I'm assuming you're talking about the one behind me. This one's a little over 100 gallons. It's just shy of six feet long. And the new tank's going to be 160. <laughs> Ish, ish. So about sixty gallons more. Um, I'm excited because yeah. I know it. it's coming soon. It's coming soon. Um, awesome. Can't okay. wait. Can't so, wait. Uh, okay, so so so, di I gotta learn how to say your username properly. Di Diaticus Reef, I think that's right. I don't think over skimming. 
Diaticus? 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 One day I'll get it. I don't think over skimming <laughs> is possible in the sense of skimming mechanism itself, but the resulting mm -hmm. nutrient food removal could be over skimmed up the chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alright. Yeah, it, it, it's debatable either way. Yeah. Um, I can see where he's coming from, or Duraticate yeah. is uh, where he's coming from. I can also understand if the efficiency of the skimmer isn't top, you yeah. know, top notch, or you don't clean it out as often as you do. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? Keeping it like spotless and show ready all the time. I got a, uh, <laughs> I got a neck cleaner now and I clean it like once a month to just caked on there and nasty. One benefit of ozone. I was tank sitting for somebody for a couple weeks and their mm -hmm. skinner, whew, when you took it off running ozone, there is like next to no smell from the skimming. It's glorious. When I skin somebody else's, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, toxic waste. It was strong. Mm -hmm. So that that's oh, the yeah. side benefit of ozone. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's also what uh, what we found out with the hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. just into the air intake. So we're effect. utilizing a quarter inch line into it. Yeah, the quarter inch line into a, the half inch line uh, yep. on typical larger skimmers. Mm -hmm. And it's just off to the side. So it's still sucking in air. Yeah. But it's also sucking in the um, the hydrogen droplets and mixing it up inside the cone and nice. actually causing it to foam up a little bit more. Nice. So That's turbocharging good. as well. Exactly. All right. I think we covered most things for today. I'm not going to keep you too late, Cruz, because I know I can. I heard the kids in the background, so you're home now. Mm -hmm. But thanks, as always, for coming on. Much appreciated. Always love hearing your, your wisdom and knowledge from your, your many industry slash hobby sides. Okay, well, thank you, uh, thank you also for having me on your channel. Yep, definitely, definitely gonna steal again fun. in the future. Always love having you, Cruz. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, yeah, have okay. a good night, guys. Thanks so and, much. And uh, thanks for the super chats. Yep, much appreciated. Everyone in the stream, thank you guys so much for coming. If you guys haven't done so, you enjoyed it, smash that like button. If you're new, make sure you guys subscribe. Do streams pretty much every week, uh, videos every yeah. Monday. Lisa, and a big shout out to you. Thank you. You've been rocking the chat today. Shoot me a message on Facebook. Oh, yes. One more thing. Yes. Um, some of the Elegant Corals Regiment is on the Elegant Corals Micro Bubbling uh, Facebook page. Well, so send, you can find uh, some of our regiments on there too. Send me All a right. link. Send me a link, and I'll share it in my Facebook group later. Sounds great. Perfect. All right. Thanks. All right. So, thanks so much, Thank Chris. Thanks, guys, in the chat. Have a good night. Good night.